Hello, everybody. It's Ali B. I have a very special guest with me. Howard Storm, pastor for 30 years, has an amazing near-death experience. Um, I'm just, this is my first uh, interview, like, my in a really long time, my second interview ever. But um, let's get into it. I'm going to start off uh, with a prayer. Um, Howard, you're welcome to add to the prayer if you'd like. Dear God, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to interview Howard Storm so that he can bring his wisdoms that he learned from his near-death experience and from his time as a pastor, learning about the ways of Jesus Christ and the ways of the universe. And I pray that this interview can be used to teach people and to help make the world a better place in Jesus name. Amen. Gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to bring your message of love to all people. We pray that hearts will be open, minds will be open, and that people will choose the path of love and follow you as you have revealed yourself through Jesus Christ, who is the perfect example of a new human being, a whole new way of living in this world, the way of love. May we convey that message in a way that people can hear it and not look at the messenger, but look at the message, which is what I hope to achieve. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, amen. So I'd like to uh, wish you a belated Merry Christmas. <laughs> um, but I actually, I actually wanted to ask you about Christmas. I, I kind of do have a little bit of mixed feelings about it personally, because on one hand, it's a holiday that emphasizes family, togetherness, love, and giving. Yeah. But it also seems like it's uh, very, uh, can be very consumerist and like yeah. materialistic at times. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, like, uh, was Christmas always like it is, um, you know, since like before, like the United States? No. Um, by the way, I think there's millions of Christians that share your exact same mixed feelings about Christmas. And I'm certainly one of them. Um, our society has been called a consumer society. And Christmas is the height of consumer has become the height of consumerism because um, we Americans, the consumers that we are, have turned. So uh, I'll just give you one real example. My sister owned a store for over 40 years. She just retired from it um, this year. And she made 75 percent or more of her income in the fall and early winter of Christmas season. Wow. And that's not untypical of a lot of places. Um, you know, I made the mistake of going to the grocery store a few days before Christmas to get a few supplies. It was mobbed. You know, it, the, this is a huge store with a gigantic parking lot. The parking lot was like full. I had trouble finding a parking space. I had to park, you know, hundreds of yards away from the <laughs> entrance to the store before I found a space. Um, you know, the, all the cash, I mean, this, this is super, super Kroger's and it's just like packed with people. Um, it, Christmas has become the, the biggest consumer product of the year. And it's interesting because like, um, I understand that in Japan, um, Christmas is very popular, but they have absolutely no uh, expression of the meaning of Christmas. It's all about presents mm. and lights and celebration and family get together. So um, as you said, the, the family get together and uh, um, love and peace that hopefully is promoted at Christmas is a really great thing. But um, the nature of Christmas has been lost. It um, used to be, used to be not so long ago, you know, a very solemn thing where um, Christmas was all about um, going to church, you know, family get together and um, 
the presents were very secondary. Uh, uh, one more story, and I'll stop on the Christmas thing. Uh, my grandfather, um, my father's dad, grew up in New, uh, St. John's, New Brunswick, Canada, and they were poor. And he told me one Christmas he got a penny. That was his one and only gift. Another Christmas, he got the best gift he ever got from his mother and father. He got an orange. <laughs> an orange, yeah. really? Well, you know, it was wintertime. They're up in the, um, you know, northeast in the winter. And, uh, you know, you didn't get fruit in the wintertime. You know, I mean, not, not something from the south. I mean, that was quite an exotic gift to get an orange. Um, so my point is, is that, you know, um, nowadays, I think a lot of people spend thousands of dollars, if not hundreds and hundreds of dollars. I mean, they spend typically more than they can afford on, on Christmas because, because, um, but is the, is the nature of the celebration all celebrated? Because I, I got to say one more thing about Christmas. Christmas is an, an invented holiday. No one knows when Jesus was born. There's no record of it anywhere. Oh, so you said you said Christmas was invented. Yeah, um, it was invented by the early church because they wanted to celebrate the birth of Christ. And so um, for good reason, they chose the, the biggest Roman holiday of the year um, to put to impose Christmas on it so that they could supplant a Roman pagan holiday with a Christian holiday. And that's how it came about in the very early history of the church. Mm, I never knew that. So, I mean, okay. um, the, the big Christian holiday is Easter. We know when that was, cause that's well recorded in the Bible, you know, that event and when it happened and all that. But um, we have no idea. I mean, Christmas could have happened in the summertime. <laughs> fall, spring, winter, we don't know. Um, we just, but that's not the, um, I mean, when you think about it, most holidays are um, creations to um, honor, memorialize something, right? Then, I mean, the, yeah. um, the, the days that we're certain of, like December 7th, the day that will live in infamy when Japan you know, invaded um, Hawaii. We know that one, but we don't celebrate that day. <laughs> no. That one's yeah. a short thing. Yeah, okay. So, interesting. Yeah, so that's a, that's a really good take on Christmas. Um, so anyways, um, people know you for your near-death experience. Um, and, you know... Uh, I know you've told the story a million times. I actually kind of wanted to focus on sort of a portion of your near-death experience where Jesus t is telling you about a future world. Yeah. Um, and we'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, you said you wanted to just uh, mention a little bit about like what your life was as an atheist and I guess how the experience changed you. Right. I um, have done a lot of interviews. and If anyone's interested in... A more in-depth thing about my near-death experience if they um google howard storm they'll find um many many interviews that i've done and also um i wrote a book um which was published in 2000 called my descent into death which is about my your death experience and they can read about the experience if they want to know it and oh sorry you broke you broke up a little bit so the book is called my descent into death yes and they can okay. get that on Amazon. And if they want to, you can buy a used copy for a couple bucks. And um, so that's accessible to anyone, which I'm happy about. If I could have published my book for free, I would have. But unfortunately, um, it costs money to make a book. And uh, Oh, you know. okay. So you couldn't really publish it for free. <laughs> no. Um, anyhow, so that's all there. And um, like I said, we're... Um, you and I are both interested in sort of going beyond the story and into some of the more, if you will, meat of the story rather than, you know, the circumstances. Um, before the experience, I do want to say something because I want people to hear this. Um, 
I was born in 46. So I have memories of the early 50s. And um, of course, the 60s were really important to me. Um, in 66, my wife and kid and I went to San Francisco because we heard that was where it was at. And I lived in San Francisco, um, more or less for seven years. Um, and it was quite an experience. So when I was um, young, went to Sunday school, but um, when I was around 14, 15, became very disenchanted with the church. I thought it was so hypocritical, particularly my father's attitude about it all. It was just a show, didn't mean anything. And then uh, I had a long talk with my pastor that I was very good friends with and um, became very disillusioned when I found out that he didn't really believe in anything. Um, and I stopped going to church and I started, um, at that time I'd started reading a lot of philosophy and I began with, um, I didn't, I obviously didn't have it in my high school. And I, I said, so just from what I learned from encyclopedias, I started with the, off with the Plato and Aristotle and worked my way up through philosophers, you know, got to people like Hegel and stuff like that. And then eventually um, found the existentialists. And that super appealed to me. So I'm talking about beginning with Camus and then going on to um, Jean-Paul Sartre and Martin Heidegger and stuff like that. Heidegger is very, very difficult to understand, by the way. <laughs> no. But anyways, the point was, is that there is no God. You live for yourself. Um, living for others is wrong. It's foolish. And that um, basically... I mean, the bottom line is that, I mean, they didn't say it, but life is short, you're an animal, then you die. There's no meaning, there's no purpose. Disillusion with my pastor and reading philosophy. Yeah. yeah. So I became um, an atheist, an existentialist, and nobody at my school knew it had any idea what I was talking about. I mean, there was nobody to talk about these things with, but I went to college at the age of 17. And my uh, first semester, I had philosophy 101. And to my um, great surprise and happiness, my professor um, was an existentialist and an atheist. And um, I met my kindred spirit and he and I, and one or two other classmates, we used to go um, to Newark, Ohio, because the time we were in was dry, no alcohol there. And we would sit in bars and drink beer until the bar closed at two o'clock in the morning, talking about um, what we believed in. And if I may characterize those conversations, it was ultimately um, cynicism and sarcasm about how stupid people who believed in anything were. That was, that was the main topic of a conversation. Um, you know, religion was a hoax, a complete fraud. Um, you know, people that believed in God were um, addle minded, something wrong with their brain. You know, there was no afterlife, et cetera, et cetera. And so we had a lot of fun, lots of laughs, drinking beer, um, getting drunk and making fun of the rest of the world, which we thought was um, incredibly um, ignorant. So um, when I had my near death experience, in 1985, because um, I was in college in um, the academic year, 64, 65. So I'm talking about 20 years later. I had been living as an atheist all that time. All of my friends were, were university professors because I was a university professor and they were all atheists. And uh, we continued those conversations from my college days about how stupid people who believed in religion were and the afterlife and stuff like that. Um, you know, basically the equivalent of believing in, um, you know, um, fairies and goblins and, um, you know, nursery stories, you know, like, you know, Cinderella didn't really happen, folks, just a story. Um, anyhow, so there are people who've had near-death experiences and I'm not being critical of them, but they came to it predisposed as religious people. Mm -hmm. I was 
as unpredisposed to what I experienced as anyone could be. Um, and I think that that's a lot of the reason why God gave me um, such a deep experience was um, I was a hard nut to crack, <laughs> hard to get to. But God wanted to get to me. And the other thing that I, I want to add to it is that um, I have felt compelled from the moment I had my near-death experience to want to talk about it. And I've met many, many people that have had near-death experiences who don't talk about it. Primarily, the reason why they don't talk about it is because um, when they did try and tell people about it, which was typically um, family and close friends, they were ridiculed and told to their face. And I've been told this by my family and friends. It didn't happen. Why are you talking about it? You know, you just dreamed it. You know, da 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 da. You know, get over it. Go on with your life. You know, it didn't matter. It was nothing. And of course, to me, it's the most important thing that's ever happened to me in my life. It's like to say it was a sacred or holy event in my life is just an understatement. I mean, it's like I consider it the day I became born. You know, I became real. I became um, who I was truly meant to be. So, as I'm saying, most people that have had these kind of experiences don't talk about them because there are in the United States, and it's been proven by surveys that there are tens of millions of people that have had these experiences. And worldwide, people have studied them in all over the world, in Africa and India and China and, you know, South America and Europe, et cetera. And, and, and um, you're saying that the vast majority of people that have them don't go public with them, right? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's, been a, and there's been a number of studies by researchers just on that very topic, which is really interesting, um, particularly uh, a doctor who's now deceased, Dr. Barbara Romer, um, studied people who had ne negative experiences and she found that there was a very um, substantial percentage of people that had ne negative experiences or there was a ne negative aspect to their experience and they um, especially don't want to talk about it because it's very painful and difficult and people don't want to hear it. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so was there anything else you wanted to uh say about the uh, near-death experience? Um, I believe that um, God is interested in what I would refer to as a great awakening in this world, an awakening of human consciousness. And, um, you know, that, that implies a religious awakening, but it's not necessarily about religion. It's about people. It's not necessarily about going to church. It's or, or joining, you know, a certain religion. It's about people's realization of who we are, who God is, and what our relationship to God is, which is the age-old question that every religion is attempting in whatever way to try and um, um, understand or articulate in some way. And um, I believe what's happening, and this is coming from my conversation with Jesus, is when he came into the world 2,000 years ago, he was supposed to be a big revelation of who God is, who we are, and what the relationship is supposed to be. Jesus' teaching, to characterize it as simply as possible, was that we should love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love our neighbor as ourselves which is stated in the Bible, both in the um, Hebrew Testament and in the, and in the Christian writings, um, in the Gospels, etc., and stated over and over and over again, and that's the basis of all Christian teaching, or put simply, um, love. That's who we're supposed to be, is we're supposed to be loving people. And 2,000 years, it ain't happening, bro. It just ain't happening. Um, and Jesus told me flat out, quote, God is is very frustrated because we were given um, a brain and a mind. And I do want to talk about the difference between a brain and a mind sometime during this interview because they're two different things. But um, we were given the capacity to think and to understand and to imagine 
and to be creative and to, you know, rationally determine what's true. I mean, we don't really need to be arguing about how big an inch is or how big a meter is or, you know, how much a pound is. I mean, we've, we've got standards for those kinds of things. So, um, we, have, we have a consensus of what we call reality on certain things. Like, I really like it when people drive on the right-hand side of the road and don't cross the center line and come into my lane. You know, I really like that a lot. And it uh, actually scares me when people disregard those, like stopping at red lights. You know, that scares me when they, you know, I got a green light and I start into an intersection and someone comes roaring through a red light, you know, to T-bone me. That's like pretty frightening. Um, so it's good when we all agree on a certain basic level of reality. Um, and the existence of something other than this is reality. Can I, can I say one more thing about that? Cause I think this is important. Yeah. Um, almost all theoretical physicists agree that 97% of the physical universe is made up of dark matter and dark energy. Um, and I don't want to insult anybody's intelligence, which means that 3% of the physical universe is the universe that we experience, 3%. And that's a little, little tiny fraction of 100%, right? Um, what scientists know about dark matter and dark energy is nothing. If you talk to any theoretical physicist, they will tell you um, openly, it's not a big secret. They, they do not know what dark matter and dark matter, dark energy is. We have, we have a small understanding of 3% of our universe, the physical universe. We call the physical universe reality because that's what we know. That's what we can observe and experience and even um, test to some degree. The rest of the universe, we don't know what's happening. So um, the Greek word for that is um, mystery. I mean, I'm translating the mysterios into mystery. And mystery means what you don't know, what you can't understand. The um, concept of God, the whole concept of religion, the whole concepts of theology are a human attempt, meaning flawed. <laughs> if it's human, it's flawed. I mean, guarantee you anything human is flawed. Um, to articulate what we think we can understand about the mystery. So is that a, um, a foolish endeavor? to try and articulate and understand something that is acknowledged by anyone who's knowledgeable that it's all a mystery. Every wise person in the universe knows that God, afterlife, the supernatural, it's all a mystery. But we want to, we want to talk about it and articulate it. Well, mm. you know, um, we're all looking for love, to use an analogy, but I think it's a, a close analogy. Um, what is love? There is not in the entire history of the English language and in no other language that I know of a um, good description of love. Yes. Um, there, it, it does, I mean, define love. Nobody, nobody can define it. You know, I mean, you, know, you come down to stuff like, well, it's a feeling, um, you know, mm -hmm. it's being kind. It's, it's caring about other people. Um, so we talk around, we talk around it. We talk, we talk about what love might feel like or look like, but nobody has ever defined love. love. Love's another great mystery. And interestingly enough, the Bible says God is love. So God's a mystery wrapped in an enigma, wrapped in a mystery. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a lot, lot of depth to the, to the mystery of God. But um, the thing that we do believe that encourage us to search for meaning and understanding of all this is that the world is full of revelations. Um, and revelation means the curtain has been torn open and we get insight into these mysteries. And um, 
I think the history of Revelation is really, really interesting. And some of the re revelations, I think, are incredibly insightful and inspired. And I think some of the revelations are false and um, wrong. Um, people have projected too much of their stuff into the revelation to give it any accountability. But I appreciate and admire revelation from all over the world, from all of history. So I'm, I'm not revelation is not just a christian thing by any means it's true it's true all throughout asia and south america and africa and you know um wherever it came from revelation is always fascinating um both ancient revelation and contemporary revelation so i would put near-death experiences into um the category of uh revelation because near-death experiences are um you know, part of this opening up of the mystery, the tearing of the curtain so that we can have insight into who we are. The interesting thing, I, I think I can conclude, conclude with this, the interesting thing about near-death experiences is that um, they are transformative experiences. I've never met anyone who's had a real near-death experience. And there are a few fakers out there, okay? Um, I don't want to go into that, but there are a few people that um, have fabricated near-death experiences, but they're few and far between. But I've talked to many, many near-death experiences. I've read many books about them and that um, they all talk about how it totally changed their life. And it certainly did mine too. My big question after my near-death experience is, what am I going to do with this? You know, how am I going to change my life? And I changed my life as much as I possibly could. And I'm still this is many years later. My experience was in 85, and I'm still trying to figure out ways to change my life, and it's still changing. Wow, that's awesome. And I wanted to touch on two things that you said. Um, I think I noticed that there's plenty of people that don't believe in God, but there's very few people that don't believe in love. And Yeah, yeah, amen. Yeah, and, uh, you know, love is something that's indescribable. You can't put your finger on it. And no one seems to question that, you know, they experienced it. But then, like, an atheist might rebut with, like, oh, well, you know, uh, people haven't experienced God. Well, no, a lot of people have experienced God firsthand. Like, it's a real thing. You, you can't necessarily describe it perfectly. Um, and then the second thing you, I wanted to touch on really quick is, so you acknowledge that there are parts of the Bible that are kind of not good and kind of tainted by... Uh, maybe human mistranslation or maybe a human might have put something in there that they shouldn't have. Yeah. Is, that, um, is that how most Christians feel about the Bible or are most Christians like dogmatically like every word is gospel? Um, I can only answer this from my experience because I don't know of any study. I've never read a study on how many people take the Bible literally and how many take it um, um, look at the Bible critically, okay? And I suspect that in the United States, most people are not literalists, not fundamentalists. They, they um, look at the Bible critically. And interestingly, there have been a number of very conservative, evangelical, biblical scholars who have written on this topic discussing the parts of the Bible that are, are um, contradictions to what God says. And liter literally, they will give you chapter and verse where God says, do not harm those people. And in the next verse, it says, kill them all, <laughs> kill all their children, wipe them out, yeah. burn their village. You know, I mean, it's like, okay, uh, which one was uh, God and which one was, uh, you know, you know, um, the, the Bible's got a lot of contradictions in it. Um, and I'm talking about particularly in the um, Hebrew Testament, but they're also in the New Testament. And to look at the Bible critically, I think, um, is part of our duty and obligation to um, understand what the words really mean and most importantly, understand the context of, um, to the best of our ability, when were they written? Why were they written? Who was the audience? What did they get out of it? What, what meaning did they put into it? And that sort of thing. Um, so that we can hopefully come to a rational 
and deeply spiritual understanding of what we're supposed to get out of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. All right, so now um, I'm really excited to ask you about this portion of your near-death experience, which is in your book, uh, My Descent into Death, Second Chance at Life. And I read it all the time. Um, I'm actually trying to sort of model myself after this kind of world. I'm trying to do my best to uh, move society into the direction of this kind of world. Um, I've become a minimalist. I, you know, wrote down like the bare minimum of like what I can get by with. Um, I plan on, and this is partially influenced by you because you donate a lot of your sales for your books to charity. I plan on hopefully, um, because I'm not making that much money on YouTube right now, but if I, if I do, um, I want to donate pretty much all of it except for like what I need to get by, which is, I think, uh, like between like one to two grand a month. Um, but anyways, yeah. So in this world, there's basically from what I've read in the book, uh, there's like no technology, um, but people are spiritually evolved. So they communicate telepathically. They control the weather with their collective will. They pray to make plants grow. They're living in harmony with nature. Um, when someone dies, it's because they want to die and their soul voluntarily leaves their body. It's like a ritual. Um, just really like amazing things like that. Um, so I have a lot of questions about that because okay. I want to find out more. And yeah. I'm hoping that you'll be able to answer some of these. Um, so I guess the, the interesting question my dad thought that this was an interesting question. So how do, because this is basically like a paradise. It's like a Garden of Eden times like, you know, a billion people. Yeah. So how do these people deal with Satan? Like, do they show indifference to Satan or do they need to stay vigilant to make sure that evil doesn't creep in in some sort of way? Um, is it something to actively work against or do they just focus okay. exclusively on like well, love? Let me... Um quote a favorite author of mine um scott peck who was a psychiatrist um he didn't believe in um god particularly he wasn't religious or anything and he started got intrigued by the idea of exorcisms and got involved with some exorcists and ultimately became became a very strong christian and lecturer and wrote books about his belief um a book that he wrote called People of the Lie was in his early process of being influenced by these exorcisms and having real encounters with evil. And one of the lines that he wrote, and I quote Scott Peck, Dr. Scott Peck, is, the only power that evil has is the power that we give it. Now, people might say, well, I experience evil in my life, but I've never worshipped Satan. I've never gone to a satanic church, you know. Um, you know. Well, you can invite evil into your life. The I'm not talking about being possessed by a demon. I'm talking about being influenced by evil. I want to make that really clear. Um, most people who studied this say that possession is very, very rare, rarely happens. But that, frankly, all of us are influenced by evil, by the demonic. You know, earlier we talked about Christmas being, you know, being metamorphosized into a purely materialistic consumer, you know, event, um, quite the opposite of its original intention, which is celebrate of the coming of the Christ child into the world. Anyways, um, that, would, that, that would be an example. Um, so in regards to the future, they have no space for that in their lives. Um, one of my favorite lines in the Bible is from the sixth chapter of the book of Ephesians. And it talks about... Um, using the 
analogy of a Roman soldier's equipment. It talks about the helmet of salvation and the, the shield of faith and um, the breastplate of, breastplate of righteousness and um, girding your waist with the truth and, wear, and wearing the um, shoes of peace. Um, when I was a kid, I always loved uh, knights in armors and um, I still like, like the whole medieval knight thing. You know, it's always fascinated me. So I, that metaphor really speaks to me. I think some people are probably like, eh, you know, they get nothing out of it. But the whole idea of um, the Ephesians chapter fix is standing firm in the faith. And if we stand firm in our faith, evil has no, there's no room for it in our lives. And um, what, what does faith look like? Faith looks like a life of trust and hope and joy. Um, that's, that's what a life of faith looks like. So like the benefits of faith are great. You know, I think people are afraid of faith because they have a terrible misconception of what it means to be a faithful person. Um, it doesn't mean that you've now taken vows of poverty or celeb celibacy or, you know, um, you know, sacrifice of everything you care about. Um, on the contrary, a life of faith is a flowering of who you really are. Um, if I may use a personal uh, example, um, I think my, I'm an artist. I mean, my whole life I've been an artist and I'm still an artist. I'm making art now. And I think that faith, really inspires me and informs my artwork. And I think my artwork's much better when um, I had no faith. Um, I think it's a whole lot richer experience because when I make art, I'm seeking inspiration, you know, and to be really inspired to try and make something meaningful and beautiful is a lot better than just making art for the sake of making art, which is what it used to be you know, before my faith. So would it be fair to say that when you have a community that's so focused on God, faith, prayer, and love, you don't really have to focus on evil. And if it does creep in, it'll be so easily identifiable. That you got it. You got it. Yeah. That yeah, you can like, just... Uh, you know, one of the things on. that Jesus showed me when we were visiting the future, which... I want to add it's not so far away from what he told me and showed me um, when a person had an injury or a sickness uh, that community would gather around them and they would lay hands on them and pray them and they would be healed immediately so i'm not saying that all accidents and illnesses are a result of the demonic but um sometimes they are you know sometimes they're just you know uh, the physics of the world working itself out. Um, you know, in our world today, miracles of healing happen. And I have been part of, I've been with people who've been miraculously healed. Um, but we don't control it. I mean, it's like sometimes they happen and sometimes they don't. In the future, 100% certainty. They're going to be wow. healed, like, immediately. So... I mean, that, that's one example. And of course, one of the illnesses that um, is very difficult to heal in this world is uh, mental illness, you know, those kinds of illnesses. Um, and in the future, that won't exist. There won't be any mental illness. Everyone will be healthy in body, mind, and spirit. Wow, that sounds amazing. That's awesome. So I'm very, I'm very interested in this, how there was no technology, um, because I kind of do go back and forth on this because tech, I, I mean, technology's done a lot of bad with how much it's hurt the planet, but there's undoubtedly some really good things that it's done as well. I mean, we're talking over the internet right now. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, like, where did these people sleep? Were there buildings? Uh, do you know how they made oh, their clothes? Yeah, uh, the two two issues here. One is I need to um, um, reconsider 
what I experienced. I have a good friend who's really into um, how technology is going to lead us into a more spiritual world. And when I saw these people, Jesus showed me around the future, everybody wore a lot of jewelry. And I'm not talking about gold and silver. I'm talking about very funky, sort of like primitive kind of jewelry, which to me looked like, you know, um, it all looked like handmade beads and stuff like that. And I just thought it was ornamentation. And one of the things that I've reconsidered um, over these decades since my experience was, I wonder if that ornamentation was in fact some kind of very discreet technology. You know, let me, let me use um, an example like, um, if I went back in time a few hundred years with my cell phone, of course it wouldn't work, but let's just pretend that I went back with my cell phone and was able to, you know, communicate. They would have burned me at the stake. You know, I mean, no, seriously, they, you know, they, you know, that, that it would have freaked them out. I mean, um, there's a possibility they had technology and I didn't, I couldn't appreciate it. It was so discreet, so um, unrecognizable to me that I didn't know it. Mm, okay. Um, I, so in response to the technology issue, um, I've come to the conclusion that I don't know whether they had technology or not. What I thought wasn't technology may well have been technology. Um, or maybe it was just ornamentation. But why would they be why would they be wearing ornamentation? Well, you know, I mean that's it's fun to decorate yourself with ornaments, but I don't, I don't, I don't, um, and the second part was, is, um, their homes. We, we never visited their homes. I never saw their homes. Um, where we were was out in nature and that's what Jesus wanted me to, I'm sure they had homes. I'm sure they had some kind of dwelling, but we never, um, we never went there. So I don't know the answer to that. Okay. Very interesting. And I know you were in like a wooded setting. Um, yeah. So like, it seems like a forest. Yeah. Um, do you know if they lived in different habitats across the world, like deserts? Did well, any of them live in the yeah, snow? Um, one thing, geez, I asked him about, well, does everybody live like this? And he said, no, there's all kinds of communities all over the world and they're all different. And he said, one of the things that people do is that if they want to, because they're in touch with everybody's in touch with everybody else telepathically. Sometimes people are interested in going visit um, other climates, other cultures. And he said that um, every village um, tends to emphasize different things. Like some villages emphasize music. Some of them emphasize the visual arts. Some of them emphasize drama. Some of them emphasize uh, philosophies. You know, some of them emphasize science. I mean, all these different villages sort of had their own peculiar um, cultural bias and were, um, you know, exploring the world in their, in their own ways. And the cool thing was, is that of course they shared all this, um, you know, they shared their cultures with each other so people could benefit from the uh, science and from the music and from the arts and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if you wanted really good poetry, you, uh, you tuned into the people that were all about poetry because they were, um, that's, that was the big focus of their culture. Awesome. Yeah. I think I'd probably be in the one that has a lot of music <laughs> yeah. for, personally, but um, were there musical instruments or is it just like vocal? Yes. No, oh, there they, were musical had, instruments. Yeah. yeah. Really? What, uh, like, was it like the same type of guitars that like acoustic guitars that we have today? Or do you remember? No, they were, um, they were different. I think the sort of the sort of ba same basic process, you know, vibrating strings and drumming, you know, on resonant surfaces and things like that. But uh, they, they were all um, shaped differently. I wonder if there's any way to record music 
or if people just need to tune in when they're when they're performing it. I don't I don't know. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, yeah, and then uh, I'm, and do you have any idea like what the what type of scientific investigation these tribes would perform? Is it just like nature observation or? I, I, I wish I could answer that, but I can't because we didn't. I didn't ask about that. See the the thing that is interesting about my experience. Jesus very carefully, very precisely answered every question that I had, but his ans he never added or subtracted to my questions. He never amplified on my questions, and so the he gave me what I was capable of inquiring about at that time and place, which I was 38 years old, no religious background, basically, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and the, the fact of the matter is, is, um, and this I have not talked about and I have not written about much is most of my questions were about me and my family. Um, I really wanted to know why I was the way I was. And we talked a lot about that. And I don't, I don't talk about it. I don't want to talk about it. Cause like, um, first of all, who cares? The only person that cares is me. <laughs> and, um, you know, I don't, I don't want it to be this to be this big ego trip. I want the focus to be on, um, what Jesus revealed to me, not about me, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, it makes sense, because at that point in your life, I mean, you, you had spent basically your whole life being self-centered, so of course that's going to influence, you know, how you talk to Jesus for the first time. Yeah, and and I had 38 years invested in becoming me. You know, it was hard to let go. It's still hard to let go. You know, oh, okay. you, you invest your whole life, I mean, every single second and moment of your life into becoming who you are, and then um, he's explaining, hmm. You need to uh, reconsider the whole thing from top to bottom. You know, yeah, it's tough. Nobody wants to change. Yeah, definitely. Well, one uh, thing that I've been researching lately is telepathy. Yeah, and uh, you know, there's some videos. Uh, there's actually like a viral video, like over a million views, and this guy says like use this technique and like you, all these people are commenting like it worked for me it worked for me it worked for me and like this one oh. guy's like i'm a diehard atheist but this worked for me <laughs> yeah um just like uh, it's basically like thinking hard about like a person and then just like trying to send like two words or something and then all of a sudden like that family member or close friend like calls them stuff like that um but I, yeah i'm just very fascinated by it because i do you have any idea like how telepathy would work between two people that speak different languages? Well, this is what Jesus told me, that we only use a small fraction of what we're capable of. Now, one of the ways that that's expressed is that scientists know that we only use a small portion of our brain, and they don't know what the rest of the brain is for. Um, Jesus told me that when we become kinder, wiser, more loving, which is God's plan. And he's talking about now, you know, he wants that plan to have, he wants us to be kinder and wiser and more loving now today, you know, um, God is going to unlock these things that we call supernatural powers. And I'm talking about telepathy, and telekinesis, for example. Telekinesis, Not only will huh? we become more telepathic, wow. but we will be able to do telekinesis, which is moving physical objects with thought. And um, this all sounds like um, crazy, weird stuff to some people like, that stuff's not real well. As you pointed out, there are glimpses right now in the here and now of telepathy and telekinesis. And there are people doing experiments and they have found, you know, uh, 
real examples of telepathic, but being in control of it, you know, like um, astral travel and things like that. So this is all, all in the realm, primarily in, I'm talking about the general culture, primarily in the realm of like science fiction, you know, fantasy. Uh, but the, the reality is, is that real, real people are studying these things and re real people are experiencing, uh, say, glimpses of them because, you know, the power hasn't been unleashed and God will unleash that power and give it to us. Just like God raised us up from animals because the early humans, you know, the early Homo sapiens were no different than the animals around them. And God gave them, you know, when the Bible says created in the image and likeness of God, it doesn't mean physical. It means we were given the ability to be rational, which is, um, for example, expressed in the Bible as the ability to discern the difference between good and evil. Um, mm. You know, um, to, to put it in different words, we have, we have the ability with our rational mind to discern the difference between right and wrong. Um, and we have the ability to be creative. In other words, to look at a problem, a difficulty, and come up with a solution to it. You know, what, what an amazing, um, you know, how do, how do I get into this meat other than with our teeth? Well, how about using a sharp rock, <laughs> you know, and cutting it, which quickly involved into um, a really interesting technology of, uh, you know, stone tools. Um, which are really quite sophisticated. If you ever try to make a stone tool, it's like really hard to do that. Um, You've tried? <laughs> yeah, I, I have, and I, I couldn't do it, but um, I, I do have arrowheads and things that I've, and um, I have some um, knives, flint knives and things like that. And they're, they're quite amazing. And they, they actually work really well. Um, anyhow, God gives us the abilities when we're ready for them. I asked Jesus, why doesn't God just give us the abilities? And he said, because we'll misuse them. Like, for example, this is a fact. This isn't science fiction. You know, the um, United States government, particularly the army, um, not only in the United States, but also in Russia, did big studies in tele telepathy in the hopes of using them for military purposes. What a wonderful mm -hmm. thing if you could telepathically find out what the enemy was going to do and how they were going to do it and, you know, and, you know, sort of invade them telepathically so that you could defeat them. This I'm going back into the forties, you know, um, apparently the Russians put a lot of time and money into investigating uh, telepathy and, of course, the Russian thing's pretty hush hush, so we don't know um, how little or more successful they were with it. And we don't know to this day really what is the army doing with it. I mean, the army's looked at a lot of interesting things, like, for example, they were the, the first big experimenters in LSD, you know, trying to see if that would um, become some kind of like truth serum or something like that. Um, so we're not ready. You know, any, anything that comes along, like you come along with like, um, you start to understand atomic energy and what's the first thing we do with atomic energy? We build a bomb. We don't build, you know, a wonderful reactor for to, to produce electricity or something like that. We don't, we don't build a device to mine minerals. We build a bomb. And, um, Right now, there's still thousands of those nuclear weapons looming around our society. Um, if God gave us tele telepathy right now, telekinesis, the world would be much in much worse shape than it is because the people obsessed with power and domination and control would use those. I mean, you know, people talk about the influence of the United States government and taking away our freedoms. Now, what would it be like if the government had the telepathic powers running the show? It'd be really, really frightening. 
Wow. Yeah, that's like a perfect example of yeah. like, and, we're and this not is, ready. <laughs> yeah, and this is from Jesus. This I'm not expressing my own political philosophical views. This, this is coming to you from Jesus. So um, you, can mm -hmm. take, you can take it from me that that's what he told me. So, yeah, so your book says, quote, humans will have the power to control matter and energy. So that's basically telekinesis. Yeah. Gotcha. And I mean, the fact that you can grow a plant in one to two minutes and then eat yeah. it. Yeah. That's also controlling matter and energy. Um, so basically, that's basically all the important stuff surrounding that is already in the book, I'm guessing, of like the different ways that we'll have yeah. control over matter and energy. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so I'm kind of curious, um, like what were the simil similarities and differences between tribal groups? And specifically, I'm wondering about like, um, did they adhere to like traditional family structures and like marriage, mono monogamy? And were they like r racially homogenous or like racially diverse? Do you know any of that? Yeah, they were definitely racially diverse. I don't know whether they were monogamous or not, but what I do know is, is that everybody in the village's primary concern was the raising of children. The children belonged to the whole village, community, unit, whatever you want to call it, call it village, um, and that everybody shared equally in the responsibility um, for the raising of the village. And that was everyone's number one focus, job, concern. And Jesus said, that's critical to the society. Now, this isn't from Jesus. This is from me. You know, when my, I had a son and a daughter, and one of my big concerns was their safety. So what did I teach my son and daughter from their earliest age? Don't talk to strangers. Don't go into anybody's house unless you ask us first. You know, go on and on. I mean, you know, there's a whole list of things that we told our kids, little, little kids, and reinforce that up until their teenage years. You know, don't, the, the bottom line was don't trust anyone. Yeah. Um, and, one of the things that I taught my daughter uh, very young was um, how to hurt a man. Physical self-defense. I won't go into the deck exact details, but let's say I taught her how to attack a man where he's most vulnerable, which two spots, <laughs> eyes, nose, and groin, you know? And one of my mistakes with my daughter when she was, um, a preteen was, I said, now show me what I've taught you. And she didn't. She, she, she dropped me to the floor. <laughs> no way. Really? No, here's the, you know, I'm like in my thirties and she's like, you know, a big, big, strong guy. And she's this little child and she just knocked me down. Um, you know, <laughs> women can defend themselves if they know how, and if they have the confidence to know how, um, matter of fact, in talking to martial arts people, the, the real secrets of martial arts are how to kill a person with one blow. And it's actually not that hard. And for example, I had a friend who was a captain in the Korean army in Korea. And he told me that's what he taught soldiers how to do, how to kill with a blow. Um, so women don't have to be defenseless, but of course women aren't taught aren't taught how to defend themselves. And I taught my daughter. Um, and I think it gave her like a lot of confluence, a uh, confidence in um, different situations. I grew up with two sisters and I didn't want to see my daughter hurt and victimized by men the way my sisters had been because I was painfully aware of some very traumatic experiences they had as teenagers dating guys who you know, try to take advantage of. Yeah, it's interesting you talked about trust. It's, I feel like it's a struggle that, I guess, 
Christians go through or, or just any loving person is that we all want a world with more trust, but mm -hmm. we live in a world that doesn't have enough trust. So unfortunately, we can't be as trusting of others as we want to be because yep. it really, yeah, it, it it's, just wouldn't work. It's a two, you, you, you. You've, you've hit the nail on the head there. It's a tremendous struggle. Like, for example, after my near-death experience, I wanted to hug and kiss everyone and tell them that I love them. And I did. And nobody liked it. Yeah, um, that's hard. Part of the that's, that part must of, be really hard. Part of the reason why they didn't like it was because I was sick. And people, what I had wasn't contagious. I was septic. Um, you know, an internal infection in my body, but um, nobody, nobody wants to be hugged and kissed by, you know, a guy in the, in, a, in the hospital. And when I got out of the hospital, um, I tried to hug and kiss somebody. And just to give you an example, one of my best friends, another art professor at Northern Kentucky University, where I was, he came to see me after I got out of the hospital and he came in and I got up out of my chair i'm in my bathrobe and my slippers you know trying to get well you know recuperating and he came into the room and i left up and i grabbed him as hard as i could and hugged him and i kissed him on the lips and he shoved me violently away and called me what are you an effing faggot now wow. and not only did he physically hurt me by shoving me violently away from him but he also rebuffed my love and so um, I don't go around hugging and kissing people and telling them I love them. And, um, you know, I'm very, I'm very careful, very, very careful about who I do that with and um, basically only do it if it's discreet and I'm invited to do it and I don't initiate it. Um, it really hurts uh, me because my inclination, and I mean this quite seriously, is to tell everybody that I love them and to show my affection. And I just want to add in, in my own defense, it's not sexual, come on, which is what it's so often interpreted as, you know, I'm not trying to make any kind of sexual advance at all. That's not, not what I'm after. I just want to, um, you know, tell people that I love them. And I, and I believe that that's in a better world, we'll be able to do that without you know, see, so when you talk about the lack of trust, it's like you, you, you know, you've identified the big problem that we, you know, Jesus said, love one another. Matter of fact, he um, said it even more powerfully. He said, put the interests of others ahead of your own. Love people more than you love yourself. Now, people say, how can that possibly be? How can we love someone else more than we love ourselves? But the answer to that is really quite simple. Love comes from God. And if you have a relationship with God, your cup overflows with goodness and mercy. Your cup overflows with love. So it's not like our love that we're expressing towards other people. It's the love of God that we've received that we have a surplus of, and we just want to share it. You know, I just want, I just want to, you know, share the love that I've received. Not, I'm not giving out my love. It's not originating with me. It's come from God. Gotcha. So when Jesus tells you to that, like what it all goes down to is to uh, love God, love each other and love yourself. It's in that order. Yeah, because that's the flow. The, the flow is from God to us, to one another. The flow isn't from one another to us, to God, it's the other way around. You know, when you think of the, um, we're talking about a triangle here with God at the apex, you know, and us at one end and, and the other at the other, uh, you know, it's a, it's a flow, but the flow originates with God filling us to overflowing and us sharing with another and then they receive that love and love themselves and love God more and share that love with one another. And Jesus told me specifically, that's how the world's going to change. The world is not going to change through laws. It's not going to change through governments. It's not going to change 
do anything. It's by people beginning to love one another. And you know, you use the word trust. Well, how can you separate love from trust? I mean, they don't mean exactly the same thing, but love and trust are so intertwined, right? That they're in, inseparable qualities. Um, to trust is to love, to love is to trust, you know? Yeah, and there's that Bible verse that says, love is patient, love is kind. I, yeah. I don't know exactly, but it says, love always trusts. Yeah. Yeah, so he, so, so Christ specifically said that laws and governments is not what's going to bring about a positive change. No, I am. Um, I have very... Um conflicting feelings about law and government. I mean, I know we need laws and government. I mean, I understand that. I'm not crazy, you know? I mean, I think that's important to have law, law enforcement, legislatures, you know, developing laws and, and governments to try and implement all this. And, and I totally respect the police and the military for, you know, trying to uh, make this stuff all work, but it's all so terribly imperfect. Um, and if you talk to people that are in some form of law enforcement, like attorneys, police, military, I mean, they, they'll all freely tell you how imperfect, you know, trying to implement this stuff is the, the law enforcement people make lots of mistakes and laws are imperfect. And, um, we have legislatures constantly rewriting laws and making up new laws and getting rid of old laws. You know, um, for example, there used to be a law that um, if you were driving a motor vehicle and came across a horse, you had to pull your motor vehicle off the road and turn off the engine because it would scare the horse. We did we did get rid of that law. Um, believe it or not, there used to be a law that uh, homosexuality was against the law and they would put you in prison for being a homosexual and like in my lifetime, we've gotten rid of most of those laws. Um, thanks be to God that we've gotten, gotten rid of those laws. Um, you know, we, tr we tried uh, laws against drinking alcohol. Well, that was a big failure. Um, I don't, you can't, we need to try and enforce morality for the sake of society, but on the other hand, um, Morality has to come from the spirit of a person from the inside. You know, um, yeah, change starts with me. Yeah. You know, we've got to, um, we've got to decide not to lie, not to cheat, you know, not to be selfish and greedy and, you know, um, try and control other people. Yeah. That's got to come from the heart. Absolutely. Uh, so, it's interesting that we're talking about laws. Have you heard of Daniel Suelo? Does that ring a bell? No. Man, I'm, I'm trying to interview him. Um, and I would absolutely love to get you two together on like a podcast because he grew up Christian and like followed Christ. And like he actually tried to like take what he said literally. Like Christ says, live like the birds. Yeah. I think Christ recommended to like give up all your possessions. Yeah. So he actually lived like for 15 years without money and wow. he lived in a cool. cave. Wow. He lived in a cave and he, he actually volunteered to help the homeless as a homeless person, uh -huh. <laughs> which is amazing. That's just amazing to me. Um, but he has some man, like I'll send you one of his videos that just blew my mind. I'd love to it see was, it. Like, yeah. Because he has like this, he just had like this philosophy about like civilization. And I was like, wow, this is like the rational argument for like uh, the future world that Howard Storm experienced in his NDE. And like, they don't even know each other. Like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I, I would love to, to get you guys together. But I think he says something along the lines of like, human laws is like a cheap imitation of natural law. Yeah. yeah. And like the laws of physics, like what we are, what God already gave us. So, yeah, man. So I thought that was uh, interesting. Yeah, he has a whole video that like really criticizes like the systems of mo uh, monetary gain and trade, 
and like he talks about like is is a bear eating the raspberry is like is the bear receiving a service from the from the raspberry bush or is the raspberry bush receiving a service from the bear and then when the yeah. bear poops yeah, yeah are the mushrooms that grow receive you know so it's it's and really and the cool. seeds that survived the trip through the bear's gut are being um, distributed in exactly. nice piles of nutrient soil, <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. So it's like this beautiful system that we already have that we yeah. kind of try. It's almost like we're trying to grow more and more independent of it, um, which is just really foolish. And we're destroying the planet in the process, unfortunately. Um yeah, so that's that's really interesting. So one thing that caught my fancy um, is the idea of hierarchy. So that is something that um, I guess has been around since like all of uh, evolution, since like the lobsters. Jordan Peterson talks a lot about that. Um, so like, did these were you able to discern if these tribes had hierarchical structures? I, to the best of my understanding, absolutely not. Wow. There was no really? hierarchy there. Yeah. Um, nobody was trying to control anybody. Everybody um, was basically trying to uh, nourish, cultivate, encourage everyone to be as unique um, as possible. And unique could also be interpreted as different. They were really into diversity. It was Interesting. Very evident. You know, mm -hmm. it's funny in our society because we see diversity um, as a threatening thing. I was a college professor for 20 years at a university in, here in Kentucky, and um, I taught art. And my students were um, all um, eccentric. You know, to want to be an art major at a university, I mean, you know, go to college and study art or music or theater, you got to be a little weird. And I, and I don't mean weird in a bad way. I know um, that firsthand. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm sure you can relate to this because, you know, a lot of people go to college because it's for them, it's vocational training. They're going to college because they want to get a better job when they get out of college. That's the motivation for a whole lot of people. People that go into art, theater and music they're not that stupid. They know that there's very little likelihood that they're ever going to be able to make a living doing those things. And I used to tell my art students all the time, you know, like there's no job. I mean, you know, if you want a job in the arts, you, maybe you could be an art teacher somewhere, or maybe you could be a graphic designer, but like, you know, it doesn't, you're not, you're not going to make a living, you know, doing your own painting or ceramics or sculpture or printmaking, you know, it's just, it's just not out there. Um, how many of you, the people listening, have been to a bar or a club and there's like a really good band playing in the background? Do you know what they're being paid? My, my son was and is uh, um, outside of his real job. He's a professional musician. He's got a band right now. Um, you know, he's told me, you know, so they, they played for beer. How many beers can you drink? You know, that's, that was your pay that, you know, I mean, if they got a gig where they made $50 or a hundred dollars for the band, you know, they were like really excited. We got paid a hundred dollars for performing tonight. Wow. You know, um, you know, the vast majority of people that go into the arts are very idealistic and they're doing for the love of it. Um, and the sad thing is, the students that I knew in the building that I was in, it was art, theater, and music. We had those three majors in our building. It was called the Fine Arts Building. Um, I talked to students, and they told me they never went into the Fine Arts Building because it was full of weirdos, and it scared them. And that wow. really, it really surprised me because, like, a lot of people on that campus, really nice, normal, healthy people never went into the fine arts building because they thought the people in there were really weird and scary. Um, we don't, you know, why is diversity so frightening? I've done a lot of international traveling and I find it exciting to meet people from different cultures and different ideas and different religions and backgrounds and stuff like that. 
I, I find it very, very um, uh, building up, you know, uh, of me to learn to learn from them. And the more and the more I travel, and I've and the more I've been in cultures, um, the more I realize I don't know and I don't understand, and I want to learn from them because there's a lot of good in, in those people. I've been working with um, Mayan Indians for the past 20 years, and I'm still very involved with them right now. And I'm still learning from them. Um, and a lot of my um, heart, mind, and spirit is attached to a people from a very different world than the one I know. Yeah. Wow. Um, okay. Wow. I'm fascinated. I, I can't believe that there's, according to your testimony, there's like no hierarchy. Like there's no leader of the tribe. And... No, no. Wow. That's, that's crazy. That's, that's amazing though. I mean, um, what about like scheduling? So we live where we go to church at this time every week on Sunday. And then, you know, time is such a important thing in our lives in our modern lives we have to we had to be here agree at a time to do this um i had to get up really early because you live all the way in the yeah. eastern time zone um but uh yeah so is there something like a church service like each week or like a or is there no routine i think they worship just... collectively worship frequently meaning several times a day and I didn't see any clocks or any evidence of it, but they, they, everybody seemed to knew, know because they were very, very in touch with nature when it was time to gather and when they would go off by themselves. Really? Yeah. So it's almost like, I wonder like who, who decided like, okay, so let's say they would pray five times a day in a group at this time, this yeah. time, this time, this time. I guess, I guess maybe God decides what time they would pray every day. I, I don't know. Um, after my near death experience, as soon as I was healthy enough to walk and do stuff, I went to a monastery to join a monastery. And I talked to the monk about me joining. And he said to me, are you married? And I said, yes. And he said, do you have children? And I said, yes, I have two. And he said, go home. You don't belong in a monastery. Take care of your family. So I, my, my attempt to join a monastery was a complete failure. I was, I was booted out, didn't, didn't, you know, um, on my first inquiry. I, I, I wanted to live in a community that prayed. You know, that, that was my heart's desire, and um, I didn't get to do that. I'm, I'm active in my church and, um, you know, um, Go, go to the um, worship and to Bible study and stuff like that. But um, I would, I would greatly love to live in more, more of the community that Jesus showed me where people just got together. But I, I don't need the ritual as much as I want the spirit, you know? Yeah. There's, there's parts, parts of church that are kind of boring and yeah, you know, and there's parts of church that are really inspiring and really, you know, rich. And I'd like to, um, I'm in the choir. I mean, just basically I'm in the choir at church because I think that singing is one of the most important ways to worship God and to build community. You know, being, being in a choir teaches you everything you need to know about being human. Oh, Wow. That's so amazing that you just said that. Wow, being being in a choir teaches you everything that you need to know to be human. Because personally, for me, man, I've been in so many musical ensembles. Yeah, I've done rap. I've done rap. I've been a drummer in a band. I played in concert band. I've I've done choir. I've done orchestra. I've done jazz band. Um, but choir was like the most spiritual and it was the most like yeah. to together and like loving. And I had experiences in choir that were just uncomparable to yeah. Yeah. 
like concert band. Yeah, I hear, I hear. Um, you know, let me let me just try and amplify what I mean. But like, in a choir, the one thing you don't want to do is stand out. We've had a couple of um, prima donnas join our choir. They didn't last very long um, because they want they wanted to sing louder and differently than everybody else. Um, they don't belong in a choir. We, there's no, there's no use for them. They can't because the whole point of a choir is harmonizing. When you're in a choir, one of the things that you do is you listen. And and I'm a bass, so I sing with the basses. But I don't just listen to the basses, which is who I mostly listen to because I, I want them in proximity to them, and that's my role. And I'm trying to harmonize with the basses. But I'm also listening to where the sopranos, the altos, and the tenors are going too. And in addition to all that, then you listen to the accompanists and the choir director and stuff like that. I mean, you do a lot of listening in a choir. Um, you know, you're you're trying to give it your best in a choir, but you're trying to do this in harmony with a whole group of people. It's it's really, really interesting. And you know, when, when it works, it's a beautiful thing. It's, I mean, it's a deeply, there, there is a thing oh, yeah. about musicianship and stuff, but there's a deeply spiritual thing. When we hit it, when we hit it and we're all one. And, and when I say one, I mean, the sopranos are over here and the altos are over here and the tenors are over here and the basses are over here and the covenants over here, blah, blah, blah. And all the, all these different elements. And when they merge, into one beautiful harmony it's life it's real life it's how we should live and so much of it is listening and caring about where the others are at you know and becoming as much as we can one with them what if what if the whole world operated that way wow paradise so would you say that like choir is like a musical microcosm to this world that Christ was describing? Absolutely. And now, now I'm going to pull out the big gun here. I don't know if I meant, I asked Jesus when he was telling me about coming back to this world, what should I do? And we had a big discussion, including an argument. And he told me the most important skill in the world is music. Yes. And I didn't I like that. that. I didn't like that answer at all because I had no musical training. I didn't play any musical instruments and I was a visual artist. I mean, I painter sculptor, right? And I was good as a painter sculptor, but music, like nothing. I had nothing. And he said, music is the best way to learn in this world, how to be. No it's way. Also, yep. And it's also, it's also a valuable skill when you go to heaven too. A lot of singing in wow. heaven. A lot of, lot of music in heaven. Wow, I feel so lucky because, uh, man, I mean, ever since I was like 12, I fell in love with music. By the time I was 17, I decided to devote my life to music. Yeah. Um, and now I've devoted my life to God. Um, I'm, my passion for music has kind of faded for now, but... I know it'll come back. I don't. I don't yeah. know how long it'll take. Yeah. Um. But yeah, that's interesting because because you because. It's interesting because you said uh, with the with the people in the tribes, everyone like celebrated each other's differences and encouraged everyone to be different. But then in, with the choir, you also said that people need to, put aside their differences and be uniform. So I guess maybe. Maybe it's about celebrating your differences, but, but working together. But when you say put aside your differences, no, I'm a base. A mighty fortress is our God. I am not a soprano. No, I can, I can, I can do a falsetto, but it, I don't like it, and I don't like hearing it, and I don't enjoy it. And sometimes our choir director makes us basses singing a falsetto, and it really irritates me because it. It's not who I am. You know, I don't like singing like this. Um, I want to be me and me is a bass. 
and don't try and make me into a tenor or alto or soprano because it's not who I am. So, you know, um, I'm not putting aside myself. I'm becoming who I really am. I, ha I have a bass voice. I don't know why I have a bass voice. It's just the way I'm made, you know? Um, so I I'm not being false by being in the choir. I'm, I'm being who I really am, you know? And um, I love hearing men's choirs and I love hearing, you know, a guy that's got a real deep bass. I mean, it just really floats my boat. Um, and there are people that don't like the bass voice, you know, there are people that love that soprano, you know, that's what they want to hear sopranos. And I, I want to hear basses. I am a bass. Viva la difference, you know? Yeah. But what, but what were you saying? You said something about like with the choir, uh, when you were describing choir, you said, you did say something about like, uh, they're not supposed to be different. Everyone's supposed to think about like how yeah, it fits but you're trying song. to harmonize. You're trying to harmonize with one another. Yeah. And it's interesting music because in the um, music, sometimes the sopranos and altos are coming down to where the tenors and basses are. And sometimes we're contrasting, you know, the sopranos are way up there and we're way down here and it works. Because theoretically, we're doing the same note, right? Hopefully, <laughs> you know, so they're singing it high and we're singing it low and it makes a beautiful sound. It's really amazing. It's magic. Gotcha. I mean, yeah, so, you know, so, we, so we, we almost never are all singing the same line. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. We're singing different lines. So would it be fair to say that like in a choir everyone's different uh the acknowledge the differences are acknowledged are acknowledged and celebrated but everyone needs to work together for the song yeah it's a blending then, like yeah I, I had a friend yeah. who owned a chinese restaurant a very successful chinese restaurant and i said so what's the secret to chinese cooking and this friend of mine sydney yun who was chinese and owned a chinese restaurant he said the secret to Chinese cooking is we use lots of sugar and salt. <laughs> and I said, really? And he said, yeah, that's what makes it so flavorful. You know, um, your tongue only tastes a few things. I mean, most of what we get from food is smell. That's what make, you know, makes food appealing is, is smell. But when it goes into your mouth, your tongue only has a few sensors. And one of them is sweet and one of them is sour. And like, if you add a little sugar and salt to your food, to your sauces and things, it's more flavorful. Because why? Because your tongue's getting more of a hit. You know, it's getting, like, ooh, this is exciting. I'm, you know, you're stimulating me with sweet and sour. And so I think there's an analogy between that and music. You know, you want a little bass and you want a little soprano, you know, blended together. Awesome. Yeah. So anyway, so that sort of uh, description I gave about like, you know, everyone's different, but working together, that yeah. that kind of rings true for these uh, tribal yeah. cultures yes. as well. Absolutely. I think that's really, really a big part of their culture. Amazing. Amazing. Um, OK, this is uh, an interesting Oh, I did want to ask about before I get to that one. I, I want to ask about uh, like sexuality in in these tribes. Uh, do you know if it was like uh, gay or straight, or do you know anything about that? I no, I don't. But I assume that that stuff wasn't important. I don't think people really thought about that that much. People were recognized for whatever their um, proclivity was, you know interesting hmm because i know a big thing in christianity is like no sex before marriage and i think a big reason for that is because of i guess uh unwanted pregnancies yeah unwanted pregnancies i would assume yeah. so yeah i just kind of would wonder how how that society would deal with reproduction like yeah I, 
you know, one. I don't yeah. know, but just speculating on that question, you know, um, our society is based, was based, hopefully still is based to some degree on a family structure because you economically, you needed someone to be responsible, you know, for the welfare of the family, mainly the children, right? And because we have um, dramatically increasing lifespan, you, you know that 100 years ago, life, life expectancy was like around 50. You know, and today it's like in, the, um, you know, in America, it's like in the 80s, you know. Um, so when a person came of age to get married and have children, they had two or three decades to raise them and then they were gone. They were dead. The Mayan village that I work with in Belize, Central America, average life expectancy is 50. Um, there are very few grandparents. There are very few old people in the village. Um, that's changing now because the, the whole village is changing economically. But um, so now people live a lot longer. And one of the things that's happened with that is an increasing divorce rate because people outgrow each other. Um, I've experienced divorce. I've experienced being um, a relationship changing over time. But part of it is because we we're living so much longer. Um, and part of it is we now have, if we choose, biological control over reproduction, namely birth control. And so people are much freer to experience sexuality. You know, that, you know, sexuality, the big thing was, what if I get pregnant? Now that's, you know, for most people, that's not a factor. You know, um, they don't worry about getting pregnant um, if they're using birth control. So there's a lot of things that are changing. I don't, I don't know how it's going to work in the future, but I think that bottom line is, I think that sexuality is way overrated. I mean, I know it's compelling. Look, I was a young man once. I understand, you know, like <laughs> driven, driven by my sexual desires, you know, totally motivated by them. But um I think that that is not a wise way to live. It's not, frankly, it's not even a loving way to live because it's more about exploiting people rather than truly loving them from a male point of view and a female point of view. And uh, hopefully we'll um, become less obsessed with our sexuality in the future, you know, and use it more wisely. And the issue, the economic issue of raising children, that was not an issue in this village. Everybody raised children. Everybody was, you know, wasn't responsibility of a couple. It was the responsibility of the whole village. My grandfather was an immigrant from Finland. He was a, raised in a rural area of Finland. They were farmers. And um, when I was growing up, he had a big vegetable garden, about a half an acre of vegetables that he grew every year. That was um, a great interest to him. And he would tell my sisters, my two sisters and I, that we should um, do our elimination in his compost pile because he said it made the uh, vegetables grow better. Now, my sisters would not do that because they thought that was the most disgusting, horrible thing they could imagine, like going out and doing your stuff in his compost pile, which was huge. So I did it a few times and he was, um, he would praise me for doing that. And, you know, as a kid, I was like, he wants our poo and our pee in the compost because it's good for the vegetables. In other words, the vegetables that we're eating are made up of like, you know, poo and pee, which was like, I grew up in a suburb where like, Poo and pee is like disgusting. You know, you don't talk about it. You just, you know, you secretly go in and, and get rid of that stuff and flush it away, you know, and it's like disgusting. And to him, it was a valuable resource. Um, 
that's that's how distorted we've become. You know, I mean, I, I <laughs> case in is funny, I, I practice pretty much normal US traditional hygiene in my life, you know, um, but I always feel, you know, I should be using this stuff in, instead of just dumping it down the pipe into the municipal sewage system, you know? Yeah, I totally uh, feel that because on my journey to become more minimalist and I want to start growing my own food yeah. in this yard that I live on. Um, I've looked into people like Daniel Suela, who I was telling you about, but also uh, this guy named Mark Boyle and this guy named Rob Greenfield. And Rob Greenfield, like, gives you tours of, like, these different ways that he lives. And he was showing video about, like, yeah, I just poop in a bucket and then this is my compost pile. I cover it with leaves. It doesn't smell. And then yeah. I use it to grow food. And, yeah. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, so that's amazing. And uh, are you cool to keep that little bit in the in the yeah. interview? Yeah, if people think it's free bolting, that's their problem. <laughs> okay. All right. Awesome. Um, great. So I wanted to uh, sidetrack for a little bit um, or just do a little bit of a different topic. But one thing that I've personally been struggling with is like pride. So, so do you believe that pride is a sin? Oh, absolutely. Um, the Greeks um, called pride hubris. And they they believed that pride was the source of all sin, and there are um, many uh, passages in the Bible where you could also come to that same conclusion that pride is the source of all sin, because you know pride leads to um, greed and this desire to control other people and for power and stuff, and that's that's where all this sin stuff is coming from. Interesting. So does that mean that it, it's not okay to be proud of yourself for accomplishing something like for making a no, great painting or no, um, no, not at all. Um, you know, one of the struggles that I've had is whenever I do something for God, for the right reasons, I always feel good about it. And I used to say to God, why do you make me feel so good? Why do you reward me for doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And God said, because I, I want you to feel good about yourself. You know, I, I want you to know that I'm, I'm pleased and that you've made me happy. You know, okay. I mean, and is that not the way that we should raise our children? Is that not the way that we should raise our dogs and cats and cows and chickens and horses and you know, parrots and our pets. I mean, you know, you, you reward them. Um, I can't, my dog's right here, by the way, I can't um, not say to my dog, I'm talking 50, hundred times a day. Good boy. Good dog. Good Patrick. I mean, I'm constantly trying to motivate him, uh, motivate him with, um, you know, affirmations. You know, and, and he, he understands good dog, good boy, good pet. He understands that. He gets that. Um, I don't want to rule him with fear and anger and things like that. You know, um, I want to I wanna motivate him with affirmation. And um, feeling, feeling good about doing something well, I mean, I feel when... when when a, a work of art I'm working on and when it works out, you know, when it basically exceeds my, my hopes and expectations of how it was going to be, you know, I'm like, I'm very happy, you know, um, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that, but no, I'm talking about pride. I would say that pride is bad when it's like everything in this world is about moderation. You know, like, for example, um, the Bible doesn't say you're not supposed to drink alcohol. It talks about, I mean, Jesus drank alcohol. His first miracle is he made alcohol for a wedding party. You know, um, it, 
the Bible talks about drunkenness. Jesus doesn't talk about sexual desire and sexual at attraction as a bad thing. He talks about lust. Lust literally means, according to the dictionary, excessive sexual desire. You know, when the desire, you know, is like controlling you and, and taking you places that you shouldn't go or don't want to go. Um, there's nothing wrong with being attracted, you know, sexually to another person or finding another person attractive. There's nothing wrong with it at all. Matter of fact, I think you should find people attractive. We were made to be attracted to each other. Um, I, I find women very attractive. I like them. I like them a lot. Um, but I try not to lust after them, you know, and I try not to be driven by that desire. Um, so pride, same thing. God wants us to love ourselves. And people that think that we shouldn't love ourselves are totally not, they're not reading the same Jesus that I'm reading in the Bible. You know, and there's some distortion of that. Um, we should love ourselves, but, um, you know, uh, loving ourselves realistically and, um, you know, hey, you know, I hit that ball out of the park. Yay for me. Good job for me. Give myself a pat on the back. You know, would I like recognition from other people, you know, for what I've done? Yeah, of course I would. I'm a human being. You know, I'd like recognition. Um, I, I frankly don't get a lot of it, but I'd like, you know, would I like more? Would I, <laughs> no. Would I, would I like my paintings to sell for hundreds of but, thousands hey, you got of that, You got that, that movie coming out, though, right? Apparently. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that turns out. Maybe that'll be a big source of uh, gratification for me, and maybe it won't. <laughs> I, you know, because I don't have any control over it. You know, they Hollywood does their own thing. So maybe, um, so maybe it's 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 perfectly fine to to be proud of what you accomplished, proud of the person that you've become, but you need to acknowledge and thank God for that. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. And you have to acknowledge that it's all from God, and yep. He's the one that gave you the opportunity to, yeah. to accomplish yeah. something. Let me let me give you a concrete example. For the past half a year or more, actually more like a year. I have been totally devoted to building a community center in San Victor, Belize for my Mayan village friends. And it's a big project. It'll be about a, um, when we're done, about $180,000 project. And one of the things that I've been doing is fundraising for it. And the fundraising has been going great. And it's far exceeded my expectations. Um, the, the money is coming in sometimes in five and ten dollar bits and sometimes in you know tens of thousands of dollar bits I mean it's just been flowing in and you know what and I'm not saying this out of any kind of sense of false humility or something it's all God I can't I can't get anybody to give me money nobody nobody's going to give me money Nobody wants to give me money, and I know I have no influence over people to give me money. What I've been doing is I've been praying, I've been hoping, and I've been putting it out there into the world. We've got a GoFundMe account, you know, and I've um, talked to people and sent, you know, letters about what I'm doing and stuff like with a brochure about what we're doing to people. And um, people have responded. You know, I, I can't tell you um, how many times people have said to me, um, can I help? And I go, yeah. And I said, how much do you need? And I said, anything you can give. And sometimes that's been 5 or $10 or $20. And sometimes it's been 1000 And sometimes it's been tens of thousands. And, and, it's, gonna, and, it's, keep, and it's keeping going. The building is um, more than halfway built now. And God is doing it. And like, I think when I say, you know, God is, God is doing this, people look at me like, yeah, whatever, you know, they, they think that's crazy talk or, you know, some kind of church mm -hmm. talk or something. But no, I mean it. I'm not doing it. God's doing it. And 
the good thing is the people down in Belize that are doing this project, they know it's all a God thing. And they keep telling me, um, you know, when we talk about the money, you know, they need money for the um, cement and the sand and the gravel and the block and, you know, the wood and all that stuff. You know, I said, it's coming, it's coming, it'll come. And they said, we know, we, we know God's going to do this. I mean, they, they are 100% confident that it's a God thing. They're, they're, the, only, the, uh, the only trust they have in me is that I will collect the money and send it to them. <laughs> they know that I will be honest in them. And I'm not keeping any for myself. Matter of fact, I'm putting what I can into it myself. And, you know, I'm staying faithful to the project. I mean, that's, that's all I'm doing. I'm just, a, I'm just, um, you know, a little, a little cog in the wheel, but God, God's the thing that makes it all happen. It's the Holy spirit and people's lives that, uh, um, contribute to it. It's, a, it's such a beautiful thing. It's been that way all my life. I could tell you all these miracle stories about how, how my money's come to me out of the clear blue to do projects, do charity. It's just, it's, it's wow. so great. And, you know, and I tell people this cause like, if you do, if you do something for God, um, God's going to get behind it. God's going to um, help you do it. Wow. Would you say that there's more faith in like a higher power or in God and like the more like underdeveloped areas of the world? Oh, uh, just yeah. like a little, yeah. like a little anecdote is uh, I lived with a troop of Mormons uh, doing door to door sales and they would always tell me that like, doing their you know their mission trip i think it was like a year or yeah. two year thing where they just knock on doors try yeah. to tell people about christ uh, they said that europe's like the the least successful place out of all the places they yeah, go to around I believe the world it. yeah so like why why do you think that is I, I mean i guess maybe it's just that our technologically advanced society kind of isolates us from nature isolates makes us more narcissistic yeah. kind of isolates us from God and just yeah. feels like we're yeah. our own God. Kind well, of. I think there's two, I mean, I think there's many factors, but two of the big factors are we went through a thing uh, a few hundred years ago called the enlightenment, which was really great in some ways because it was the advance of science, the advance of medicine, the advance of learning, the advance of technology, blah, 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 all the things that make the modern world, you know, so successful materially, you know, came out of the enlightenment. The bad part of the enlightenment was they threw the baby out with the bathwater. They said like, you know, religion's just a lot of nonsense and superstition and none of it's true. And like, you know, the only thing that's real is science. Um, and so our society, if you, if you were to ask me, what is the religion of the United States of America, and this is more true of Europe, and I've been in Europe a lot and talked to people there. The, the religion of Europe and the United States is materialism. And what religion we practice is just like a little veneer, primarily, on our materialism, because like, you know, what really counts in the United States is not worship, but it's like, how big your church is and how big the band or orchestra is in your church. And, you know, they're all professionals and they're, all, you know, you've got a big paid choir and stuff like that. And you've got these giant screens in your church that each screen costs, you know, ten, twenty thousand $20,000 a piece. And you've got six of them up and stuff like that. It's a, I mean, the whole, the whole big attraction in religion is um, mega churches that, uh, you know, you know, as a pastor, and then look at like their budget and their budgets are like a million dollars a month. You know, the churches I've served, the budget would be like, you know, $15,000 a month. <laughs> no big difference. Um, so our, our religion is materialism. And um, I would suggest that a lot of people that call themselves Christians and other faiths are highly materialistic and not spiritual. And, um, the the other another factor is is that um, we've seen because of communications we've seen all the flaws in religion um, and there's been so many scandals sexual scandals monetary sc 
scandals um, that has brought religion down in a lot of people's eyes, um, which is like, oh, guess what? Religious people can be flawed, just like doctors, lawyers, politicians, you know, plumbers. <laughs> you know, if, if we if we drudge, judge religious people by the same standard we judge plumbers, you know, it would be a much more equitable society because there's good plumbers and there's bad ones. And I've experienced both of them. Um, you know, I've had plumbing done in my house where the joints literally fell apart because they didn't cement the joints, didn't solder the joints. It's like, really? Seriously? Oh, no. wow, that's crazy. Um, anyhow, so there's that factor. Um, I think the really big factor is, is that there's a huge increase in narcissism, narcissism in our society. And um, another word for narcissism is, is that um, another way of defining narcissism is like lacking empathy for other people that you don't really care about other people. You're only interested in yourself and your self-importance. And I think that that's become epidemic in our society. Another big factor in our society is um, fear because of a rapid societal change. And I'm all for rapid societal change because I think the world needs to change a whole lot from where it was and where it is. You know, the good old days were not so good. Like it wasn't very long ago that we did a, a radical thing that was very controversial called child labor laws. It was no longer legal to employ five-year-olds, six-year-olds, eight-years-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-olds in your factory and have them work, you know, 12 hours a day, six days a week. That became illegal. Oh, what a good idea. That was controversial. Um, women's suffrage, women getting the right to vote. You know, that was controversial. There were riots. Women were beaten up when they demonstrated for women's voting rights. You know, men went out into the women marching in the streets for voting rights and beat them up and sent them to the hospital. Um, <coughs> very controversial. Um, we need change. You know, women's rights still being fought to this day. Women still make 70 cents to the dollar that men make in, in the workplace. Um, LGBT rights are very controversial, especially controversial in religious institutions. And that's going on right now. And it's been going on for, you know, 20 or 30 years. Um, we need to make all these changes. The, the point that I'm trying to get to here is all this change has scared a lot of people. Society is changing. Um, women's rights, gay rights. And one of the things that's um, happening that I read about, but you don't hear much about is um, the wealthier in America are getting wealthier and wealthier and the middle class and the poor are getting poorer and poorer. You know, for about 30 years now, the middle class has not made any progress in our society in terms of um, their real wealth. And back in the 60s um, with Linda Johnson, there was a thing called war on poverty. They were, like the hope was we were gonna eliminate poverty. That never happened. I mean, we've got as much poverty in this country, people living in really, really poor circumstances as we've, we've ever had. And then there's um, one more issue that scares people, and that is um, racial harmony, racial equity. There's a lot of people in our society that are terrified that people of color, black and brown, Asian people, want to be treated equally in our society. And a lot of people find that frightening and can't accept it. So we have all these things threatening a lot of people, uppity women, uppity black people, uppity Asian people, uppity, you know, uppity this and that. And meanwhile, the great middle class, which could I use the term working class? You know, you know, these are the people that do the work that make society work, you know, that they, I mean, they, they're the engine that's driving this whole society. They're getting screwed economically. And meanwhile, the, the top echelon um, 
I was just reading an article, you know, it's like uh, Elon Musk is worth um, $300 billion. He's called the richest man in the world, but uh, Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and others are right behind him in their hundreds of billions of dollars. And I am not anti-capitalistic. I'm not a socialist. I'm not a communist, but like, um, you know, we have other people that are making, um, you know, $7 an hour and less. Um, you know, I, I was, I was at a, uh, well-known chain restaurant. I probably shouldn't mention it. And, uh, I don't know why the waitress who was a woman in her fifties came up to me and um, I asked her how it was going. And she told me I make $2 an hour plus tips, $2, $2 an hour plus tips. Yeah. And I said, how's the tips? And she said, not that good. Um, you know, when I was, um, uh, 16 years old, I was making $2 an hour plus tips. That was a long time ago. You know, that was 50 years ago. I was making two. I was making two. So that, that's the service that are making two dollars an hour plus tips. I mean, it's like it sucks. It's terrible. It's so unjust. And um, so, my point is, there's all this change, which is freaking people out. They're having a lot of trouble adjusting to it. You know, and they don't understand it. They don't like it. It's it's threat it's threatening to them, and they and they're not getting anywhere, and their families aren't getting anywhere. The fact of the matter is, my grandparents believed that the world would be better for their children. My parents believed that the world would be better for their children. I hoped that my the world would be better for my children, and I'm telling you flat out. Any sensible, rational person in our society knows that the world is not going to be better for their children. It's going to be worse economically. I have 10 grandchildren. Their future prospects are bad in terms of how well they're going to do economically. And they're all educated. Yeah, I feel you. I mean, it's, uh, it's really complex. Um, I do disagree with you that um people of color are fighting to be like have equal rights and be treated equally um i don't necessarily want to get into that but um in in terms of like uh wealth inequality i i did hear that um wealth inequality is like the biggest indicator of like public health and like the countries with the biggest amounts of wealth inequality it hurts the rich and the poor people um and then, yeah, I mean, I, I can, I definitely see how in a lot of ways there's less like economic opportunities for the younger class, but I feel like there's also simultaneously growing opportunities on the internet for people. I feel like uh -huh. the internet is really uh, bringing people together and um, giving people opportunities to make a living on the internet. Like you have the gig economy where you can just do gigs like random gigs for people online you have like fiverr is a website where you can do stuff for like five dollars a pop for like a simple gig you record a voiceover you you know do whatever you want so there's almost kind of like this breaking away of like their traditional like governmental economic model into like this independent like yeah. people working together to yeah. help each other on the internet i, I feel yeah. like there's I feel like the world is kind of moving in two different directions, like simultaneously. I feel like on the one hand, there's this clamp down and like people's opportunities being taken away, the earth being polluted, but simultaneously yeah. people are connecting and like there's kind of a breakaway from like this governmental power structure. Yeah. And, um, so it's, it's two kind of opposing worlds like growing and growing and I'm just really kind of Personally, I'm kind of nervous to see what's going to happen when they collide. And I feel like they, they probably will collide. And I feel like it, it might have to do with something with uh, the what Christ was talking about in Matthew about like the end times. Yeah, I, I worry about that, you know, well, I, um, I mean, I 
I have little understanding of the gig economy or anything like that. I'm not technologically savvy, but um, like one of the things they're doing, I, I mentioned this community center we're building in Belize. One of the big features of it is going to be a computer center because the kids from the village who go to high school um, become computer literate, but they don't have any access to that in the village, only at school. And so one of the things they want to do is um, give everybody in the village access to computers so that they can get on the internet and like, hey, you know, learn, grow, you know, become. Um, I think it's like a really big, it's going to be a really big contribution to the village to have that computer center there, which everybody in the village will have access to. So you're right. I mean, there's, there's stuff going on, but like the whole, you know, nine to five, you know, five days a week with Saturday and that, I mean, that's disappearing, you know, that whole world of, I mean, people are now like, you know, working at home, you know, half the time and going to the office, the other half of the time and stuff like that. Right? But there's still a need for carpenters and plumbers and electricians yep. and people like that too. You know? Yeah, I think there's always going to be a need for those, you know, shitty jobs, the job cleaning toilets and yeah, plumbing, carpentry. Uh, I don't think robots, you know, are no. anywhere near uh, able to do that kind of work. So this is my this is my tentative economic philosophy. This is just how I feel right now. But I feel like there should be a maximum income. Um and I feel like all of that extra money that's generated for, for the maximum income should somehow be used to make those necessary jobs pay more, to make like janitors yeah. pay like a middle class lifestyle. Because I think it's just, I don't know, I think it's kind of ridiculous that someone can get like that much money and own that much land and like Lamborghinis and have that much power even though it doesn't statistically it doesn't increase happiness like once you make 77 grand a year your happiness doesn't increase anymore no, after that no and you know you have like what does a thousand dollars mean to like a multi-millionaire versus what does a thousand dollars mean to a fast food worker trying to raise a family yeah. it's like it doesn't even register on the yeah. the millionaire's radar no um and then yeah i just I was having a debate with someone about this and, um, or I guess I'll say disagreement. And I was like, how could, you know, how you're okay with Jess Bezos making like $30,000 an hour. And then I looked it up. Yeah. He's making 8.2 million an hour. Wow. Prefers personal wealth. So yeah, that's just how, you know, that's just how I, I definitely feel like wealth inequality is a huge problem. I'm not sure. That maximum income is the best way to deal with that, but this that's my opinion for now. Well, the re um, rea reality yeah. is is that very wealthy corporations, very wealthy people pay little or no taxes, and that's just a fact. You know, I'm not suggesting we put a limit on wealth. I'm just, it would be nice if everybody um, paid a fair share of uh, their income in taxes, you know, to the contribution yeah. of society. That's a good point, too, and actually is a very good leeway into a question I, I want to ask you about power. So you said that God doesn't care about power, right? How much power you have. Yep. Well, let me that, let me illustrate that in my life review, which we started at the beginning and went through my life chronic, chronologically with the angels showing episodes of my life, every time I had an achievement in my life, they would skip it. And I'd say, you just skipped my promotion, my award, my, um, you know, you know, every, everything that I strive for in life to win awards and get promotions and recognition. Every time that happened, they would skip it and go on to something else. And their response was always, that's not important. What is important was how you interacted with the student, how you interacted with your wife, how you interacted with your child, with your parents, things like that. Um, yeah, it was very disheartening because my whole life was dedicated to achieving things, you know, recognition, power, success, wealth, you know, the American dream. That's what we're all about. 
That's what everybody's supposed to be living for, you know? And I, yeah. and I did it with all of my, um, every ounce of my energy to be successful in those things. I wanted to be successful by the American standards of wealth, power, position, recognition, you know? And they made it really clear to me that stuff doesn't matter at all. Yeah, I feel like uh, not only is materialism a religion, but success is a religion. Yeah. Um, in America, in America, probably more than anywhere else, to be honest. Yeah, because um, well, you 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 know success by the material possessions that a person has. Yeah. You know, um, like for example. Um, when you meet someone, one of the things you want to find out is where they live. And when you find out where they live, you want to know in detail what part of that town they live in, because then you know what size house they have. And then you know how successful they are, how much wealth they have, by how big their house is. Like when you, when you live in an area long enough, you know what streets have the big houses and what streets don't have the big houses. You know, and what streets have the crappy little houses and you don't even want to go down that street because it's, you know, too nasty. You know, I mean, this part I live, I live um, in a suburb of Cincinnati, Ohio, in Kentucky, and uh, there's parts of Cincinnati I don't want to go into, especially at night because they're dangerous, you know, poor areas. And there's yeah. other parts of Cincinnati that I love to drive through during the day and look at the ban look at the mansions. You know, and mm -hmm. I'll know. I'll, I know I will never own one, but it's nice to have the fantasy. Of, boy, what would it like to be like to live in that fifty-room house? You know. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 pretty crazy. Um, and okay, so back to the power thing, really quick. I would be lying if I told you that I didn't want more power. Uh, the reason that I do want more power um i'm not necessarily saying it's a good thing that i want more power but it's the truth i kind of do it's because i feel like i've tried to be a good person pretty much my whole life yeah. i've done a lot of deep thinking i've studied a lot of philosophy i've tried yeah. to connect with god i'm learning from you all this stuff and i know that if i had more power if i had more followers if i was more famous then i could use that power for more good so you're saying that it, it's it's wrong for me to want to gain more power to do more good no no i don't think it's wrong at all um if you can if you can keep your eye on the prize which is doing good go for it if you want the power to build your ego then it's a bad thing like for example um I pastored churches for 30 years. I'm retired now. And um, <laughs> I mean, no one thinks of pastors as very powerful, but you actually do have some power as it, I mean, as a teacher, you have some power and you can use your power as a teacher, as a pastor, two things I know to um, serve people and do them good, or you can use it to exploit people. And it's very disturbing to me when I see preachers, pastors, priests using their position to stroke their ego and to gain wealth. And I've tried really hard not to do that. Good, man. That that one priest, I don't think I know his name, but you probably know him. He has like all these private jets <laughs> and he got stopped by like an inside <laughs> Yeah. An inside edition interviewer and he was just like staring at her like a demon and he, he oh man it was uh just uh, it's crazy yeah it's really bad it's very disturbing as a as a pastor to see that kind of exploitation of the position so the the bottom line here really is what's your intention what are you doing it for if you're doing it for good if you're doing it for god it's okay if you're doing it to just um, build up your ego, build up your wealth, then it's not okay. Gotcha. Well, that that gives me uh, reassurance because I I think you know 
I think I'll do a good job of yeah of you know keeping my eye on the prize as you say yeah um awesome yeah so I wanted to ask you one more question about like the the that tribal world um it says animals live in harmony with humans do the animals live in harmony for themselves is there is there still like predator and prey I don't know the answer to that I think it's a really good question and I wish I'd asked it but um I don't know. Gotcha. Okay. Um, great. And just really quickly for my sake, and I guess for some of the audience sake, can you quickly explain like what a monastery is? Yeah. Um, there are all different kinds of monasteries. Some of them are very strict and some of them are very loose, but basically, uh, a monastery is where a group of men decide to live communally and they live um, the, the monastery that I'm familiar with, which is a Cistercian monastery. Um, the common name for them is Trappist, but they're officially, they're Cisterians. They follow the rule of St. Benedict. Um, very, very strict monastery. They did have a rule of silence, which now they don't have that anymore. Um, now it's okay for the monks to talk to each other up until a few years ago they were not allowed to talk um they met for worship seven times a day um and the worship services last approximately one hour so seven hours out of the day they're worshiping together so they do make sound i mean they but their sound is uh, worship and their primary worship is they go through the Psalms. They go through the 150 Psalms in three days. They, they chant the Psalms and do other things and things and prayers. Um, very, very disciplined life. When I said they didn't talk, they were, when they were not allowed to talk, they did use sign language. So like if, when they weren't praying, they were out like milking the cows and tending the garden and stuff like that, you know, washing the floors and, so they did, they did have a sign language, a silent language that they use. But um, anyways, um, very, very disciplined, very, very structured life. But the whole idea is the more you adhere to the structure of the discipline, the more you just get into a routine and just, your life is a life of prayer. And in talking to the monks down there, they told me that why they were there was they prayed. Because when they weren't, in worship, praying together, they were encouraged to be praying individually. So that was what, that's what attracted people to the Cistercian Monastery was to pray all the time, collectively, individually. Um, there was their whole life was prayer. So that was that, that type of uh, monastery. But there are other kinds of monasteries, but uh, this is one that I'm familiar with. It's called the Abbey of Gethsemane. Um, it's wow. In Kentucky. And so <laughs> I'm considering now, <laughs> can I bring my cat? Probably not, right? <laughs> uh, sorry, um, no pets. But but they do have farm animals that they take care of. Wow. So, okay, yeah. So you've only ever, like, visited them. You've never, like, participated in one? Well, I, I go to their worship. You're allowed to go to their worship. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's fascinating. It almost it almost seems like this twenty one eighty five future world takes like this like this bit of culture from this thing that's happening in society now, and that bit of culture from that thing. It kind of like takes yeah. all these good little yeah. parts from different yeah. corners, yeah. and then just like combines it into one like paradise. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So. So that's why, I mean, one, th one thing I was t talking to you about Joe Rogan, one thing that Joe Rogan talks about is that we need to get over our toxic tribalism. And yeah. he harps on that all the time. And I think he's totally right. I agree. Because I agree. On honestly, I don't think one niche has like all the answers. I mean, yeah. I guess you could say Christianity, but even Christianity, like it's missing things too. There's lots of problems with the yeah. church and... Yeah, I like that. I've and never heard that before. I like yeah. that idea of toxic tribalism. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Rogan talks about that all the time. 
Um, oh, dang it. What was I going to say? Well, it's just a manifestation of narcissism when we say, my group is right and everybody else is wrong. Yeah. And you can't be in my group if you don't agree with what we think and do, you know, nah, 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 nah. It's yeah, like a, a little was... clique in school, you know, like you can't belong to our clique, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, I was going to say, um, I really loved it. Oh, I loved it so much when you asked Jesus, um, what's the best religion? And then he said, the religion that brings you closest to God. Yeah. And I was like, oh, you know, you know, right. I had to have an experience because I couldn't dream up those good things, those great lines like that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so, like, the way that I take that is, like, if I become friends with, like, a devout Hindu, like, a really good person, yeah. prays, is trying to do good things in the world, I'm not going to try to convert him to Christianity. Right. Like, I was in, know, um, he's on his path to for God. Yeah, know? I was in China, in Beijing, China, at a, a hotel, and um, it was early in the morning, and I was up, and I met a woman in the lobby, and... I said, what are you doing here? And anyways, she explained to me that she was a Buddhist and she was there to do something involved with her. And she said, would you tell me about your faith in Buddhism? So she did for about an hour. And I just sat there and listened and asked her questions. And at the end, I said to her, I said, you know that we are the same, that we're brothers and sisters. I said, I'm a Christian pastor, but we're the same. We believe the same things. And she said, really? And I said, really? I wouldn't say that if I didn't believe it. And she was very surprised. And I've had that same experience with Muslims and Hindus and other people. Mm -hmm. I guess the biggest thing is that is Jesus. I guess that's the one other thing that's the divider. Would you say that like a devout Buddhist or Jew... I guess after they died, it's revealed to them that Jesus is the gateway to God. Yes. And then... Yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. Wow. Well. Uh, yeah. So I'm 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 through like all my my questions, but I think uh, we've been having a a really good talk. I think this has gone very well. Good. Um, I've enjoyed it. You know we've. Um... We've gone into uh, a little depth on some things that normally I don't get the opportunity to do, so I appreciate that opportunity to get into some stuff more deeply. Oh, well, I appreciate you so much uh, being here to answer the questions that I wanted to have answered. Um, I, I remember you mentioned something about, like, Kenya, and was it Kenya? Like, it yeah. was, like, a really amazing experience, and you almost oh. wanted to live there. Oh, absolutely. I was... Yeah, I wanted to... Yeah, I was there for 10 days. I was there to preach. And so I did several times a day to all different kinds of audiences. And the Kenyan people were so loving and so kind. And before I went to Kenya, people warned me about the dangers and I might get um, kidnapped and taken hostage and robbed and pickpocketed. I mean, I got all these people telling me all these scary things about going to Kenya. And I was in rural areas and I was in urban areas. I was in poor areas. I was in wealthy areas. I mean, it's all over at different places. And my experience was all love, 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 love. And the people were so beautiful and so welcoming. And um, almost every um, dinner I had was in, some, in a new person's home. They would invite me into their homes and have dinner with them. And, you know, of course, they brought in a lot of family. It was, it was, I was like, I fell in love with it. And I was just like, oh, I want to live here. This is so much more loving and kind than the United States. But of wow. course, I had to come back. Is there anything else you wanted to add for the people, Howard? No, I'm good. I'm getting tired. Okay. Well, let's see. Is there a way I can stop the recording? Oh, yeah. I got a lot of uh, equipment stuff that I got to think about. So No problem. I'm... I'd like to think I'm pretty patient. You know, I was a teacher for 20 years and a pastor for 30 years. I'm uh, very much into the working with people mode. Yeah, you know I have a music ed degree, right? I'm sorry? 
Did you know that I have a degree in uh, music education? No, I did not. You have a bachelor, yeah, so a bachelor of science about. or a bachelor of arts, whatever. Yeah, bachelor's in uh, music ed. No. Oh. Yeah, so I know all about the teaching world, you know, after doing student teaching and everything. And man, teachers are so undervalued. It's insane. Oh, I know. It's um, it's really shocking because what could be more important than raising our youth? Nothing. Jesus told me that was the most important thing in the world was how we raised our children and teachers, you know, make less than carpenters. Welders make mm -hmm. two or three times what a teacher makes. And I, I mean, I, I'm not trying to diss carpenters or welders. I think those are great professions. Um, but why are teachers so undervalued in our society? And if you talk to any teachers that are in the public schools, like in the cities, their biggest problem is no support. The students treat them with disrespect. The parents are hostile. You know, you probably heard this from lots of people in the past, but in the old days, you didn't want to get in trouble at school because your parents should be really mad at you and you'd be punished at home. Right. It wasn't there wasn't the threat of what the teachers or the vice principal was going to do to you is what your parents were going to do when they found out that you'd been in trouble at school. Now it's the opposite. If a teacher sends a kid to the principal's office or gives them a detention, they know the parents are going to come in and read them a riot act and threaten to sue them and have them sent to jail and da 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 da. da. It's awful. I've had so many teachers in my congregations who wanted to be teachers all their lives were dedicated to it. And after a number of years, they quit and went into something else because they couldn't take the. Mm, really? Yep. 